After a bunch of outstanding novels in the 60s and early 70s about the need for zero population growth, why did science fiction seemingly abandon the issue until recently? It was very uncool, you know, to, uh, it was very cool for a portion to talk about zero population growth, population control and stuff like that. And uh, suddenly it became very uncool, mainly because <laughs> nobody would do anything about it. Anybody who tried to do anything about it got jammed early, fast, stopped. Uh, if it's coming back at all, I, I applaud it. I, I saw uh, TNT, uh, you know, Turner Network Television, uh, doing a series, and CNN was supposed to be doing a series on on the population problem and all the rest of this stuff. I, I hope if, if it's coming back into fashion, it has to do a lot with the fact of that 70,000 people a day who are starving to death. Uh, we, we set up, in fact, it's, it's uh, one of the points that's made several times in uh, Sea of Glass. You set up a situation where uh, you have to fail. For example, uh, let, let us take our current mess, Somalia, uh, and before that, Ethiopia, and you know, there's Bangladesh, and all, all these other things where you have got hundreds of thousands of people starving to death and everything else. And, and the first thing that pops into everybody's mind is let's have a rock concert and send them a lot of money and food, and that will solve the problem. And what is not understood is that this entrenches the problem. Basically, what the people who are starving need to do is to pick up guns and take care of whoever it is that is, you know, the situation. Things have to change. And there's one thing that uh, the subsidy, however it comes, whether private, government, however, the subsidy makes it necessary to keep things as they are. I don't know where it's going to end. It, it frightens me. Uh, and what frightens me is how the people who really have influence in this area don't live in areas who are being crushed by this particular problem, uh, so they don't see it. Nancy, how many mouths have been added to the world now? Hmm, this is not a case of the more the merrier. While Joe Haldeman wouldn't presume to lecture a third world farmer, in David Brin's novel, Earth, the U.S. government only allows third world refugees to enter America if they sign a document promising not to be fruitful and multiply. David, it's Rick. I'm looking at overpopulation, and in Earth, you suggested legislating legal limits. Are we ready for that severe a solution? The fact of the matter is that by our modern Western morality, childbirth is a right from God, though it never was in any other civilization. But I don't see Western civilization turning away from that very quickly, very easily, because we've developed a new morality that is a wonderful new morality. It gives hum human beings rights that no other civilization ever gave them. And I'd like to see that preserved. But the time may come when, in order to accept refugees, an exhausted Canada, an exhausted America says, look, you're just going to have to give us something in return. Uh, and that's what I depicted in the novel. In Earth, you describe the U.S. as the world's first adolescent civilization. What is the major lifestyle change that this adolescent needs to make in order to reach adulthood? Well, we're already starting to make this adjustment. And that is, uh, when I was a child, a, a mayor got elected uh, mayor of Los Angeles on the, on the sole promise of ending wartime recycling. Well, now recycling this next year, which has been going on in different communities in Southern California, will be draconian in all, in all parts of Southern California. Um, people are starting to feel that they owe their grandchildren something. Now, this is very difficult for the world's first adolescent civilization to conceive. Think about it. Um, what would you do f to save the lives of all your children? If they were, a, you know, a car was careening on them. You throw yourself in the way. You give up your own life for your children. What would you do for your grandchildren? You'd pay for their, for their university education, if you had it. What would you do for your great-grandchildren? You'd write them a $5 check and send it in the mail with a little card. 
biologists call this uh, the diminishment of, of investment. But if you take this calculation further, mm -hmm. you know, you should, if you had the, uh, if there was a bus filled with all of your great grandchildren, right? You should be willing to die for all of them just as much as for your children, because that's your entire genetic inheritance as well. I mean, I'm making this sound very cold and rational, but it, it correlates with how people actually do react. Now, the point is, the bus is the Earth. Eventually, in 150 years, uh, 200 years, your genes will be spread in every country of the globe. If you want to protect your great-great-great-great-grandchildren, the only way you can protect them is by saving the entire planet. Now, this is a very difficult concept to get across to the world's first adolescent nation, the world's first adolescent civilization, because we're short-sighted. But at some point, we're going to have to get into late adolescence, where you start thinking about the future. And, and that's, I guess, you know, what, what, in answer to your question, that is what we've got to do. Right. I understand shortly after you wrote Earth, you visited Easter Island, which is a major setting in the novel. I've always been fascinated by those massive sculpted heads that cover the island. What drew you to such a desolate, out-of-the-way place? Easter Island is a metaphor for what we are doing to this planet. It's also proof that Western civilization is not the first to despoil its environment. Uh, a book by John Perlin, A Forest Journey, demonstrates that all prior civilizations despoiled their environment to one degree or another. They weren't conscious of it. They didn't know. We're the first that is conscious of it and knows and is actively trying to stop. But we're also doing with five billion people and chainsaws and high technology and voracious appetites to a huge, resilient ecosystem what the Easter Islanders took four or five generations to do with stone tools to a tiny, frail environment. It's exactly the same thing. Well, at least there's one thing to look forward to. We ingenious creatures that we are will spoil our planet, poison ourselves, but leave behind some really amazing artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could make horrible, desolate art, <laughs> like the Easter Island statues. They, they, all uniform, all horribly oppressive figures. I think one of our major motivations for saving this planet is to prevent our children from, from having that kind of attitude. Good point. Thanks, David. Science fiction authors have offered all kinds of solutions to the population problem, from enforced abstinence to planned parenthood by plagues. Obviously, some of the stories are simply designed to shock us into dealing with the issue. But take a look. Here's the world's population in the 1800s. Each dot represents a million souls. Watch how it grows during the Industrial Revolution, and then it really starts to balloon during the modern information age. You see, population is an exponential problem. I mean, we're now adding a quarter of a million hungry mouths to the planet every day. That's a New York City of babies every month. Scary. Obviously, anyone who thinks we can simply continue to be fruitful and multiply ought to do a little arithmetic. Nancy? So much for safety in numbers. Next week on Second Nature, with the end of the Cold War, Western countries plan to turn swords into plowshares. Unfortunately, only the Canadian Army still uses swords. Also, the future of wind power. A Senate subcommittee could cancel the funding, or it could power a small town. And by the generous support of 